Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to wherever you are dialing in from. And thank you for joining us for today's event, Partnerships and Grassroots, Unite, Fund and Act to End FGM. I'm Matt Jackson, London Office Director for UNFPA, the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all along with our partners for this event at the Phi Foundation. Every year on the 6th of February, the United Nations marks the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation, FGM. This year's theme is No Time for Global Inaction. Unite, fund and act to end female genital mutilation. Every year, at least 4 million girls are at risk of undergoing FGM. Many countries are now experiencing a crisis within a crisis, as COVID-19 reinforces existing inequalities and increases harmful practices imposed on girls and adolescents. Two million additional cases of FGM may occur over the next decade due to COVID-19. Today, we are celebrating the power of grassroots activism and how strengthening partnerships can help us reach our common goal of ending violence against women and girls, including zero FGM by 2030, as set out in the Sustainable Development Goals. We're using the hashtag act to end fgm so please join us on Twitter and other social media platforms. Coming up, we'll hear keynote remarks from the UK Minister for Africa, James Dudridge MP, and UNFPA Executive Director, Jenny Cater, and a conversation with grassroots activists and global coordinators working together to end FGM. Hosted by friend of UNFPA, actor and activist, Pearl Mackey. But to get us started, here's a short clip produced by the Global Media Campaign to End FGM and UNFPA about action taken by grassroots activists in 2020 to find innovative ways to end FGM despite the challenges of lockdown. This corona what to do for play play with at all people actually are now more than ever during this pandemic glued to either the local tv or the local radio because of following the corona updates and all these coronavirus is actually for real it's not just about that child being abused but that child could also be infected through this process Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome. Hi everyone, Naima here from the Global Media Campaign inviting you to another webinar. Next week, Thursday 2nd of July, we will be exploring the role religious leaders have in ending FGM. People these days listen more to radio and whatever comes out of radio seems to be the fact. The media has a whole lot to do in creating more awareness. Uh, but it should not be underestimated. It's a powerful tool if properly used. Save a girl. Together, we can end female genital mutilation in this generation. I am now very pleased to introduce remarks from James Dudridge, Minister for Africa at the UK's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office. Hello, 
As the UK's Minister for Africa, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to join you in marking International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation. Ending harmful practices, including FGM, is a key part of the government's overall strategy and commitment to promoting gender equality, for standing up for the right of girls to be educated, and ending preventable deaths of mothers, newborns, and children. I'm very grateful to the uh, UN Fund for Population Activities and the Five Foundation for bringing us together and to the activists and organisations joining here today who are driving forward change and speaking out, working together to end FGM. Today a girl is about a third less likely to be cut than 30 years ago. Thousands of communities across Africa have already decided to abandon uh, FGM practices. And we're seeing more and more legislation and policy to support the end of this practice. Of course, there's still far to go. And we know that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is threatening the gains that have been made. We need to unite and make the 2030 target a reality. The UK government stands by uh, the Africa-led movement to end FGM. We co-hosted the 2014 Girls' Summit, which helped galvanise global commitments. We also know more now about how change happens, and the UK aid programmes have helped build this evidence. Since 2013, UK-supported programmes have helped 10,000 communities pledge to abandon FGM, and over 4 million girls to receive health, social and legal services related to FGM. We've helped the Gambia, Nigeria, Mauritania and Sudan to make the practice illegal and Burkina Faso, Egypt and Uganda to strengthen their laws. Now, as the UK's Minister for Africa, I'm particularly encouraged by the big steps forward that the UK has supported in the high prevalence countries in Africa. In Sudan, we back the innovative work of the Salima Initiative, helping to reduce the social acceptance of FGM. In Guinea, the vast majority of girls sadly undergo FGM. And the UK uh, embassy there, the British embassy, has played a leading role in raising awareness of the risks, encouraging local activists uh, and indeed national leaders to work to end the practice and promote support uh, from international partners. The UK has collaborated with the UNFPA to advance comprehensive sexual and reproductive health rights uh, and to end harmful practices, including FGM. Now, I welcome the reports uh, that are being issued and launched today. On this day, Zero Tolerance Day, we must pay tribute to the powers of grassroots activism and the communities that lead change. And I'd particularly like to single out uh, Nimco Ali for the work that she uh, has done on this issue, um, particularly uh, working with ministers over the years. The UK stands with you all. We must act to end this practice. I'm pleased we've given uh, this chance to support our shared goals of seeing a world free of FGM by 2030. Thank you very much for your efforts. Thank you very much for inviting me today. And I wish you all the best uh, for uh, this productive event. Uh, and may we uh, move forward to our 2030 shared target. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your contribution and for the UK's continued support for partnerships working to end FGM. I'm now very pleased to invite Diany Cater, UNFPA's Deputy Executive Director for Programmes, to take the floor. Welcome, Diany. Thank you, Matt. Honourable Minister, dear partners, colleagues, distinguished guests, I am honoured to join you today for this discussion on partnerships and grassroots. Unite, fund and act to end female genital mutilation. I would like to thank the United Kingdom Honourable Minister for Africa, James Dutridge, for his remarks and commitment to ending FGM, Pearl McKee for moderating today's discussion, and the Five Foundation for co-hosting today's event with UNFPA. This year's International Day for Zero Tolerance of Female Genital Mutilation 
is more important than ever. COVID-19 has disrupted the fabric of communities, leaving millions of people at risk of falling into extreme poverty. The gender impact of the crisis has increased violence against girls and women, particularly domestic violence and harmful practices, such as female genital mutilation. Lockdowns and movement restriction have left many trapped at home with their abusers. Due to the disrupted preventing programs by the pandemic, there are additional 2 million female genital mutilation cases that may occur over the next decade. And we know that some 11 million girls are at high risk of never returning to school. Many programs and activists working to end FGM have had to innovate to reach girls at risk and to engage communities during the pandemic. I am looking forward to hearing from the experiences of today's panelists, including from Kenya and Nigeria. The good news is we do see improvements. Girls today are one third less likely to be forced to undergo this human right violation than two decades ago. Yet, while change is happening, progress is not fast enough. Just like our approach today, Generation equality presents an opportunity to strengthen the global movement to end female genital mutilation by amplifying the voice of girls and women, by galvanizing grassroots organization, youth activists, government, civil society, and the United Nations Agency to accelerate equality and empower women and girls. UNFPA recently launched a premier on conducting public inquiries to eliminate female genital mutilation. The Premier serves as a tool for countries to conduct inquiries that help transform the harmful gender norms that drive female genital mutilation, building consensus for its elimination and educating girls and their communities on their right. UNFPA partnership with donor government and civil society are crucial to support the UN Joint Program to End Female Genital Mutilation. Even in these challenging economic times, I hope and have no doubt we can count on to the United Kingdom and our other partners continued support to give voice to girls and to empower their participation in decisions that affect them. We are now in the decade of actions which calls for sustainable solution to generate an unstoppable movement towards achieving the sustainable development goals. Eliminating harmful practices remain a priority to achieve gender equality. I call on the global community to reimagine a world which enables girls and women to have voice, choice and control over their own bodies and lives without stigma without discrimination and without violence. We must unite to strengthen collaboration, hold commitment maker to account and empower women to lead social changes in their communities. We must fund to invest and scale up what we know works and we must act to build coalition among women and youth organization to support transformative change. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Diani, uh, for launching the primer on conducting public inquiries to eliminate FGM and for inspiring us as we move into our discussion. I'm now uh, honoured to introduce Pearl Mackey to lead the conversation. Pearl is best known for her starring role as Bill Potts in the BBC sci-fi series Doctor Who. Pearl has appeared in a range of TV, film and stage productions, including The West End, and most recently shot survival thriller feature Horizon Line and starred in the independent dystopian feature The Deal. Welcome Pearl, thanks for joining us today. Thanks Matt and thank you for having me, I'm really pleased to be here. It's a pleasure. Now you've been a champion of women's rights and human rights for some time now. Um, what inspires you to use your platforms to make a difference in people's lives? I'm not sure if anything has sort of inspired me to use my platform uh, to champion women's rights and human rights as such. Um, I mean, to me, it sort of felt more 
like a duty. Um, as, as a queer black woman who played the first out gay companion on Doctor Who, um, a lot of people have told me firsthand what a difference this representation has made to their lives, you know, their sort of day-to-day -day existence. Um, and whilst as an individual I don't want to be seen to represent one marginalised group, for example, I, I don't want to be the poster girl for gay black rights or for black women's rights, for example, because I think it's diminishing to think that one voice could possibly represent the individual thoughts or opinions of such a diverse portion of society. Um, what I do feel is important in my position is to use the platform that I have to amplify the voices of underrepresented individuals um, and of charities and organisations who are working to realise the rights and needs of women and girls across the globe. Um, it's, it's so crucial that we work to enable women and girls to access free education, sexual and reproductive health care, sanitary products, contraception, free and safe abortions, and that ending dangerous and detrimental practices like FGM across the world, so that the simple fact of being a girl doesn't hold them back from realising their true potential. Um, for me, uh, a quote that I often return to uh, is an Audrey Lord quote, um, I'm not free as long as any woman is unfree even if her shackles are very different to my own. So that's um, something that I like to remind myself of and um, yeah, something that inspired me to be here. So thank you for having me. Great, and we're, and we're very pleased that you're sharing that passion uh, with us today. Um, let's move on to the discussion. Our speakers, um, you can now please turn on your cameras and over to you, Pal, to introduce your panel. Cool. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome all of our panellists. Uh, we have Nimco Ali, OBE, co-founder of the Five Foundation, Natalie Roby Tingu, founder of Mishana Empowerment Karaya in Kenya, in Kenya, sorry, <clears throat> Dr. Christopher Ugu, Executive Director of the Society for the Improvement of Rural People in Nigeria and Men Engaged Nigeria Network. Basma Kamel, Salima Youth Victorious Ambassador for the Diaspora, and Mireille Tushiminina, Global Coordinator for UN Joint Programme to End FGM, joining from Addis Ababa. Nimco, um, I'd like to start with you. Uh, grassroots are hugely important to ending FGM. What support and grants are the Five Foundation providing to grassroots organisations during COVID? Hi, um, thank you, Pearl, and um, thank you for um, co-hosting this um, UNFPA. So the Five Foundation um, has specifically through um, the COVID period been supporting um, 20 plus um, grassroots organisations, women led and also some men led by Dr. Christopher and um, Natalie on the call um, in, in eight countries. So, so what we have done is actually fund grass um, frontline activism, which is the key to ending FGM. Thanks, Nimco. Um, I'd like to bring in Natalie. Uh, as, as, as you said, Nimco, uh, Natalie received one of these grants. Um, can you tell us, uh, Natalie, how you work with girls and their communities, particularly to respond to the nearly 3,000 girls publicly paraded in Kenya in defiance of the ban on FGM? Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you to UNFPA and the Five Foundation for this invitation. So as I was listening to the opening remarks about, um, you know, the number of girls, the more than, um, you know, a million girls who are at risk of FGM, I reflected back on what happened here a couple of months ago. So um, within four weeks of October and, Nove October and November last year, more than 3,000 girls within the Korea community were subjected to female genital mutilation. And um, I can only imagine when we're speaking about these numbers, having lived them, it's, it's, it's devastating. I can share that um, I spent most of my time between that period in and out of police cell, um, you know, uh, consoling with girl survivors, uh, looking out for support for them, and even most importantly, being able to, you know, support the rescue of more than 100 girls who were fleeing FGM. So what happened, especially with the support of you know, the Five Foundation is that we were able to reach more than 150 girls who are at direct risk of FGM. And that made sure that more than 150 girls were safe. So despite the fact that we lost so many girls, more than 3,000 girls to FGM, we were certain that, uh, you know, a, a hundred plus or hundreds were safe. And that shows the power of girls, the power of girls taking lead. Girls ran away for more than 40 kilometers just to get to safety 
we had girls who gave up their lives for their younger sisters to not get cut. And that shows that the, when we continue to, you know, to build the agency of girls, when we continue to empower girls to have a voice, to know that FGM is sexual abuse, nobody should be able to touch the genitalia and mutilate it, then we're able to have sustainable change. And then also encourage communities to support that decision. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Um, community engagement is an important piece here. Uh, let's turn to Christopher. Um, I know you have a lot of experience in working with men and boys to end FGM in Nigeria. Uh, what can men do more of to end FGM in their communities? Yeah, thank you very much, um, Pearl. Um, of course, the whole trigger for female genital mutilation is actually about power relationships. It's all about patriarchy. And of course, we do know that men are the custodian of culture, custodian of um, morals. The implication is that if there's any need to change that paradigm, then we must involve men and boys, which is why we have come to recognize the urgency and the importance and the imperative of involving men and boys to end the whole issue of female genital mutilation. How do we do that? Number one, we need to involve men and boys to change the whole concept, the whole idea of thinking that unless, you, unless and until you cut the girl, then you are sure she will be marriageable, she will not be promiscuous and all that. But we all know that all these things are patriarchal considerations that are just to underscore the importance of an equal relationship between men and boys men and females. So what we try to do, number one, is to get them to understand that courting a girl does not make her more marriageable. It doesn't even make her any less promiscuous. If somebody decides to be promiscuous, she, cannot, she would always be promiscuous. As a matter of fact, we undertook a little um, research work in a brothel in a local community of Go. And we discovered that most all, virtually all the girls in the brothel there are caught. So it's not really because the of is caught or not caught that makes her to be promiscuous or otherwise. So the implication is that we need to work on the minds of the people and to change this behavioral thought that when you caught a girl, she'll be more marriageable. When you caught a girl, she'll be less promiscuous and all that. Number two, we needed to work with the boys to recruit champions among them who would go further to begin to apply. Oh, sorry, Christopher. I think we seem to have lost you there. Uh, Christopher, can you still hear us? To fire our voice. So will you go Sorry? Oh, I think you're back now. I'm terribly sorry. I don't know if that was my internet okay. or yours. So I, I was just trying to say that Go ahead. most of the young boys are now marrying on court girls as a demonstration of their conviction that it's not about being caught or otherwise that makes a girl promiscuous or otherwise. And it's working. I mean, we, we now have the vanguard of young people who are champions, who are working, who are marrying young girls who are on court. And it's spreading like wildfire. People are beginning to accept that and um, it's working. Uh, of course, again, there is also the issue of uh, there is what we call this rites of passage, and um, we we'll have a ceremony we now do among the young girls, you know, naming ceremony without cutting. Because what has happened is that on the eighth day of a girl being born into this world, the ceremony of cutting will, will take place. But we have now replaced it with naming ceremony without cutting. In other words, we try to make people still be happy, dance, eat good food and all that, but there will be no cutting. And again, it's touching on. Maybe I stop at this point. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Christopher. Um, now, Thanks. let's hear about how multilateral organizations are working with grassroots. Uh, Basma, you're a youth ambassador with Af with Africa's with African, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Africa Union Salima Initiative. How is the African Union leading the process in Africa to end FGM? 
Okay, thanks Per for, for your question. I would say the African Union has been started since 2017 designing and launching programs to engage uh, and empower young African uh, youth on continental issues and the SIVA program is one of these um, uh, programs created by the Department of Social Affairs in a partnership with Youth in Boy. Uh, within the framework of the Salima Initiative, which is the African Union Initiative on Elimination of Female Genital Mutilation launched in 2019. And the Salima uh, Youth Victorious Ambassador Program is the first ever platform for FGM survivors and young activists to be directly involved in an in institutional uh, level, allowing six young ambassadors from survivors to take part in advocacy and here I would like to thank the African Union and the program partners UNFPA and UNFPA UNICEF joint program for giving us this chance to be part of uh, female genital mutilation elimination in Africa. So the African, um, uh, the human, pardon, the Human Rights Council uh, qualified FGM as a human rights violation at the request of the Africa group and uh, with a historic education of over 100 countries, uh, opens new international law mechanisms and show the urgency within an FGM is now being treated as an international um, level. And the African Union part here is leading that with support of partners, UNFPA and UNFPA UNICEF uh, joint program by equipping all member states to um, adopt an implementa uh, implementation of legislation to eliminate FGM in the continent and service provision where survivors can find and help and support and to have safe space to share and speak out, uh, allocating budget for national activist activities and creating monitoring me mechanisms in order to improve the quality and um, responsiveness of prevention and response services, reporting mechanisms where African Union can monitor member states, countries' progress and uh, are in line with commitments made earlier and promoting an active and meaningful participation of CSOs and community groups uh, into monitoring budgets and policies and activities assigned to NFGM in the community. Thank you, Basma. Um, and Mireille, from your experience working with grassroots, um, how can the UN joint program to end FGM be expanded on the ground? And how can grassroots contribute to the data needed for ad advocacy work? Thank you so much for your question. But I just had to say this before I even answer it. I'm really happy that we can all uh, together, you know, come together with our collective strength knowledge to, f to further help validate the incredible work of grassroots activism, such as the likes of Natalie, Christopher, Basma, who have lent their voices and amplify all the calls to accelerate the progress, uh, the process in, um, in order to meet the SGD target of zero FGM by uh, 2030. To be more practical, grassroots uh, can contribute by strengthening uh, multi-sectoral measures that will include um, addressing root, cause, uh, of, um, uh, root causes of FGM, which include gender inequality, social norms, formal and informal education and awareness, engaging, uh, engaging with older generation youth, men and boys, as Christopher mentioned, uh, human rights institutions earlier, uh, the uh, deputy uh, Madam uh, Diene uh, uh, Keita also uh, uh, um, spoke about uh, briefly spoke about our primer, uh, our primer uh, that we've launched we've recently launched to really engage with national human rights organization to reshape the narrative, a narrative that documents critical issues and creates opportunities. Uh, for social change that paved the way uh, to, to 2030. As UNFPA efforts are often based on high quality data and evidence to show results and accountability, grassroots are uniquely placed 
to support national, regional, global efforts uh, to meet the commitment of promoting and protecting human rights, uh, which include, of course, zero tolerance FGM, ending child marriages, harmful practices. And uh, lastly, I mean, this is a celebratory moment. This is a decade of action and uh, uh, of more solution-oriented program, which presents the opportunity for all of us here to recalibrate and recognize that accelerating this process is essential for the achievement of SDGs, especially SDG 5.3, which we are more concerned in a joint program, whether we, uh, uh, it will be met or missed by 2030. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marie. Um, right, so we're building up a picture here of how grassroots needs support and funding and how working with the international community can help to boost and mobilize advocacy work. Um, Natalie, um, I want to come back to you. Um, can you tell us more about the importance of putting girls' voices at the centre of campaigns? Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I would just like to pick up from where um, the previous speakers left. And um, I think the f looking at it, uh, when FGM is performed, it's the bodies of girls that are cut. And in most cases, like I'll give an example of the girls in my community, a girl will be cut because she'll be promised a mattress, a mattress to sleep on. A girl will be cut so that um, she can feel, you know, have uh, um, in increased marriageability as it's, as it's presumed. And the moment that we, we constantly, yes, we constantly talk about ending FGM, but if we miss out on engaging the girls who, whose bodies are being cut, and the girls who have the opportunity to change, to change the narrative and to break the cycle in their, gen in their families and in their generation, then we are missing it, we are missing out. And I'll give an example. Um, one of the girls I met uh, last year, October and November, said that she had to undergo FGM. Uh, she, her and her siblings are orphaned, and she had to undergo FGM so that her younger sister could be safe. And she did that so that her family can continuously support them. That is an example that shows that girls have no option because at the end of the day, uh, options are taken away from them. But when we center, we center uh, ending FGM around girls, we're able to ensure that they feel safe and they're able to make informed decisions. We know that these decisions also hold a lot of water because we have seen girls in various parts of the world being able to stand and say that I am not going to get cut and uh, this is how you know and they take the measure of running away and supporting even other girls to stand. Another thing is that we are certain that when we make sure that the current girls are able to understand the effects of FGM then FGM stops with that generation. We are certain that these girls are not going to mutilate their daughters. It's unfortunate that um, they could have undergone FGM, but we have seen from even the work we are doing is that girls are willing, girls are, are, are certain that they're not going to pass it over to the next generation. And for me, I see that as a, as, as a sustainable way of making sure that we end FGM. We end FGM with this current generation. Another thing also, we have seen the, um, you know, the cost. Recently, WHO released a, a, cost, a cost calculator on, on, the, on the harm of FGM. When we constantly perform FGM on girls, which then, who are then become women, we are losing, we are losing a lot of money. We're losing money in, forms of, in form of billion dollars in development. So for me, I look at, I look at yes, um, accelerating, uh, you know, multi-sectoral approach. I look, at, I look at engaging the rest of the community, but I see the engagement of girls and supporting girls to understand and to you know, to raise their voices against FGM as a sustainable option. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and Nimco, we've got, some, we've got some great examples of what works. So what's the funding barrier? Do we need structural change to how we fund work to end FGM? 
Yeah. So, we, so we know what works because it's ex, 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 exactly like women like Natalie who are speaking and talk and talking about the first hand. But the but the main boundary is racism and 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 sexism. Um, multilaterals and philanthropy will always trust white people. Will always trust white men in order to be able to save Africa. And I think we have to change that. So you just seen eloquently um, eloquently how Natalie has spoken about her own community, the actions that she's taking and the work that she's doing. Any business person would want to invest in um, and, and, and Natalie and, 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 and ensure that Kenya leads the way in terms of ending FGM. But because of the fact that Natalie is based in Africa, Natalie is a woman and Natalie is black. And so are many of the other activists that are leading this conversation. We're not getting the money to them. So it is actually really simple is the fact that we talk about Black Lives Matter, but the true black people that are being suffering at the moment are young black girls on the continent of Africa and seldom do we actually invest in them and those that are working towards them so it is actually sad to say but it's very clear the like the barriers are racism and sexism. Thank you Nimco that's really important points there. Um, I'd like to bring Basma back in here. Um, so we've heard about funding situation from Nimco. From, from your experience Basma, Basma um, what is another gap that still exists when it comes to ending FGM? Um, one of the gaps I think is still exists is uh, lack of support for survivors of FGM as medical and mental support. Uh, I would speak about my personal experience. I would say in, in back home in my country, I was trying to seek support um, mentally and you know to come over the trauma of FGM, and I couldn't find easily. And when I moved to back to the UK, I started to see also try to find. Uh, how NHS is supporting survivors, how uh, CSOs are supporting and guiding survivors to find such services, where I find um, the Dahlia project and Forward UK um, guided me uh, to find the psychological help and I started my social action project with Twizy Shea Fellowship to share uh, experiences of uh, Egyptian women about FGM and speak up and educate the society about about it and uh, you know trying to destroy the stigma of speaking in public about FGM and this message uh, also is one of the key messages of Salim initiative applying with uh, um, the African Union decision I mentioned earlier where uh, governments should provide services to survivors as part of ending FGM process and this is where I can say how it's important such services can help changing women's life to overcome their traumas and educate women about their rights to seek support and share pain with their partners and male allies. Um, this part um, is also part of my advocacy against FGM and how we can stop FGM uh, in the continent by 2030 uh, by service provision and education um, provided to people uh, to educate people about FGM and um, its consequences physically and mentally. Thank you. Thank you, Basma. Um, Mireille, there's, there's positive to news too, though, isn't there? I mean, from new commitments to end FGM made at UNFPA's ICPD 25 summit in Nairobi in 2019, to new laws strengthening the criminalization of FGM in Egypt, a country where over 90% of girls and women have undergone the practice, um, Marie, could you tell us more about how we can be optimistic for change? Thank you so much. And uh, you are right. We have to be optimistic for change. Less than 24 hours uh, ago, e uh, Egypt arrested a father and a retired nurse for carrying out a female uh, FGM on um, 15 years old after announcing the plan to toughen the penalty to 20 years. So we, we can see that... Uh, Egypt has shown strong regional political support and I'm over, I'm over and I'm thrilled of Egypt's actions, you know, really to join other nations such as uh, Kenya in legislative um, against this practice and really setting the, the, the bar high for other member states to follow their leads. Um, while being so optimistic uh, about the changes, uh, I would like really to remind uh, my colleagues in UNFPA and, and partners uh, to take forward the implementation of those commitments to remind that uh, uh, the member states still need our full support, particularly uh, reaffirming um, the commitment to addressing FGM with the organizational 3-0 
and accelerating the process on ending FGM via, uh, via, via policy reform at the international level. Uh, here at the joint program, we started engaging with the regional economic uh, communities really to push the country's uh, commitment. We are now uh, uh, coming up with uh, a new strategies with the data uh, fellows to really uh, monitor, closely monitor tier three countries, uh, uh, you know, countries such as Somalia, uh, uh, Mali, Guinea-Bissau, and Sierra, Sierra Leone and all. Um, so this is basically what we are doing and I'm excited is, you know, really uh, newly uh, coming on board as a global uh, coordinator. And we need business for us, the time is really there for us to unite in one voice to have a common message and to push for uh, more resources. Listening to Basma's story, Natalie and Christopher is really giving me more to think about how we do our work with countries and with uh, our implementing partners on the ground and also reviewing those policies that is really holding us back and, and for us to really try to push them forward. So, I mean, there is a lot. Uh, we have little time to grow to 2030, but I'm very optimistic that together we're really going to accelerate the FGM and arms practices. And all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mireille. Uh, Christopher, um, turning back to you, um, we're hearing about some great work today. Um, how can we scale up to take this beyond a community or country level to really end FGM globally by 2030 as set out in Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah, thank you very much, Pearl. Um, to scale up our intervention beyond just communities, but to also national, regional, and of course global, we need to think along about six frameworks. Number one, we <coughs> must work on our patriarchal social systems. Everybody must be concerned about the power inequality between men and women. Because the whole thing about female gentleman is all about suppression. It's all about marginalization. It's all about unequal power relationship. And so we must, that paradigm has to change. Number two. And putting in place laws, policies, acts of female genital mutilation and child marriage, for instance. In Nigeria, we have the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act of 2015. That particular act criminalizes female genital mutilation. But the, the question is, how much of enforcement is being carried out? How do our law enforcement agents see this? So there's need to begin to educate our law enforcement agents. Because again, you discover that our law enforcement agencies are patriarchal also, which is why a girl is brought to, a girl reports a case of a rape, for instance, or female genital mutilation, for instance, and they'll begin first, as soon as you come to the police station, they'll begin to ask, oh, it's because you're putting on a mini skirt, that's why they had to rape you and all that. These are mindsets we need to change. The third one is about our education and curriculum. You see, we, are, we should be thinking of putting in place some content within our curriculum that talks about ending female genital mutilation. The next one is the level of internet penetration, even among the rural people, among community members. If our statistics show that by 20, 2005, the number of internet users is about 1 billion people. But today, by 2015, it's gone up to 3.5 billion internet users. And this includes both rural and urban dwellers. So we can take advantage of this new penetration and begin to see how we can send messages, behavioral change messages, through our phones. Because by this, we'll be able to get far into our system and change the narrative. So that by 2030, which we are targeting, female genital mutilation will be a thing of the past. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Nimco, um, we're talking today about partnerships to end FGM. What types of partnerships are needed and how can we strengthen and maximise collaboration? Um, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's about the local and the global partnerships. So ultimately, one of the key things is the fact that the UK is hosting a G7 in about a few months. And that's a massive partnership. In order for us to be able to support the continent of Africa and, and, um, and in FGM has to be key, key to that. And for me, it's about talking about funding Africa's female future. I think there are three elements to funding Africa's female future. One is to provide for the uncut girl who was born in this decade. And that ultimately is about ensuring that the adolescent girl that was failed has access to be able to be educated and can continue her education. And the mother who was unable to save her adolescent girl or the sister of the adolescent girl who is the mother of the, um, like the uncut girl has the, has the opportunity to be employed and to be able to make her own money. I think what, what we do is that we solemn look at Africa as a continent that can be empowered and a continent that can actually trade with the world. And that's what we need to do. I am a survivor of FGM, but my daughter, if I do have one, is not going to be cut. My sister and my nieces and all these are not going to be cut because I've been educated and I've been economically empowered. I have the money in my pocket to make choices. And that is fundamental to the women of Africa. And we have to make that case to African leaders. Natalie talked about FGM costing 1.4 billion to the economy of Africa. Women have to be assets at a state level, not at a community level. When when a girl is cut, she's sold for more cattle, but she's costly to the actual state. So for me, partnerships are both at working with the incredible activists like Natalie, making the case at an international community to the G7 leaders, and then talking to our African leaders to say that if we do want to end poverty, ending FGM is really at the heart of that. So um, for us at the Five Foundation, partnership goes from the grassroots all the way up to the CEO to the um, to 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 the head of um, global leaders such as the the UK and the G7 um, other countries so yeah ultimately it's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a broad like you know membership and we don't take anybody's work for granted so the great work that um, that Natalie is doing is 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 as important as 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 the case as the UK prime minister is, is going to make in June to his other fellow um, world leaders Brilliant. Thank you, Nimco. Um, and just to sort of uh, sum up, uh, I'd like to ask um, each panellist just for a, a really short response, if we could just, uh, each of you could offer one thing that would make a really, really big difference to ending FGM. Um, so, Nimco, shall we start with you? Um, a collaborative fund that gives money to incredible women like Natalie and men like um, Christopher who are working on the front line to um, end FGM. I, like, you know, I really can't campaign for more than that. We need to be able to fund um, African women. Um, we've, we've talked about this side of the world where a lot of our um, experts or creatives of, of colour are always asked to work for free women on the front line, black African women on, on the front line are working for free and INGOs are sucking up all the money. So I think we have to talk about the, racis the racism and the power in imbalance in this. So a collaborative fund that both philanthropy and um, UK government um, can fund into is what I know will end FGM. Brilliant, thank you, Nimco. Um, Christopher, shall we go to you next? Um, I, I like to make my short comment by quoting Nimco. Uh, that was, I read some of the things she, she, she said at some point. And she said, and I quote, we will end FGM only by backing frontline activists. From the Gambia through Nigeria to Kenya, FGM has been fought most successfully at the grassroots level. This is very important because in sometimes donors have this penchant for looking for, um, I don't want to be, seem to be biased towards um, Western um, NGOs, but the reality remains that if we must deal with issues of Africa, we must also involve Africans in being part of the solution to those problems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. Um, Natalie, could we hear from you next? Um, wow, um, I'm really inspired by, by the remarks from Nimco and Christopher. I think for me, I will, con I will constantly sing that for us to end FGM, we must build on the assets of girls. Um, that means uh, investing in girls' education, investing in their economic well-being, investing in access to health and justice. 
in our communities, starting from the grassroots. And just to re-emphasize on, on what has already been said in terms of supporting frontline activists, most of the frontline activists are young women and girls, and we need to back them up to end up here. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, Mireille, um, go ahead. Oh, I think you're still muted, Mireille. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much, Pearl. After listening to Ninko, Basmat's story, Natalie and Christopher, all I can say uh, from the joint program and for donor side that we are here to support the road to 2030 and I'm hopeful and I know we can achieve it if we all come together collectively supporting each other. As I mentioned earlier, we mean business and this is the time involving private sector as well, uh, just to mention that as uh, uh, moving forward. So all of us working together jointly, I'm sure that the road to 2030 looks quite promising. That's all I can say. And of course, we're here to offer our full support. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and finally, Basma, let's hear from you. Thank you. I would add to all the comments we, we have we have lessened today, like improving educational curriculum and funding um, organizations and working collaborative, collaboratively to uh, end FTM. I also would say um, we can't ignore um, survivors and we have to provide services where we can help them to come and feel they are good women and not to feel the trauma that they had FGM when they were young and because it doesn't end when, when you had FGM when you were um, nine or seven and, and that's it. No, you continue with your life with the trauma when you become a mother, when you have a daughter and you're scared about her. So we have to provide services to protect young girls and to protect survivors from having this trauma and trying to help them live their lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Basma. Um, and I'd like to thank all the panelists today um, for your insightful and inspiring comments and responses, um, and also for your contributions and the excellent uh, work that you're doing across communities and countries, um, empowering grassroots and building partnerships so that we can end FGM once and for all by 2030. Uh, Matt, back to you. Yes, thank you, Pamela, and thank you, panelists. Some really inspiring messages there from Natalie's story about uh, her example of girls um, walking 40 kilometers to escape the abuse, uh, to Christopher's work um, with boys to become champions, to break the stigma of FGM, um, and Natalie's work stopping um, FGM within that generation. This is our generation where we can end FGM once and for all. Um, and Basma's story about working to end the stigma about speaking out about FGM, let alone the practice. Um, and this uh, uh, all boils down to um, what Mireille was saying about grassroots who are uniquely placed to support work on national data so that we can use that as part of advocacy work. And Nimco's key message about collaborating on funding, um, linked to Mireille's about collaborating on action, where together we can raise the awareness and raise the funds to really end FGM. So the only thing left for me to do uh, now is to thank our keynote speakers, Minister for Africa, James Dudridge, and DNA Cato. Um, our panelists, Nimco Ali, Natalie Roby, Christopher Ogwu, Basma Kamal, and Mihai Tushiminino. Moderator, Pearl Mackey. Our partners for this event at the Five Foundation, and all of you for your continued support. And please continue um, this conversation to unite, fund, and act to end female genital mutilation with the hashtag Act to end FGM. Uh, so thank you and goodbye. <laughs>